more on the suspect from people who knew him. The opposition pushes Justin Trudeau to denounce Donald Trump. And it's a turning point night after the first 11 days of President Trump will ask three key questions which may determine the shape of the world ahead. Grisly details of the mass shooting in a Quebec City mosque are emerging tonight. The assailant had two guns, opened fire, left the mosque to reload. He came back and started shooting again. In all, 25 people were hit, six of them fatally. Those six men were all fathers, professionals and academics. Several were immigrants and chose to make Quebec City their home. One of the men, the owner of the local grocery store, was well known for helping newcomers adapt and integrate into Canada. At least one funeral will take place Sunday. As for the survivors, two are still in critical condition. In a few minutes, Joanna Remiliotis will look further at some of the victims. The dead are being remembered tonight at a church service. And we're also learning more about the suspect, Alison Northcott leads our coverage from Quebec City once again tonight. Allison. Peter, people gathered at this church tonight for a mass to honor the victims. It's one of many displays of solidarity in the aftermath of this tragedy. A moment of silence at the university where one of the victims was a professor. This is also where the suspect went to school. People who knew him described 27-year-old Alexandre Bissonnette as introverted and quiet. He had a job with Quebec's blood donor services in a call centre. Alexandre Bissonnette lived in this apartment building on a cul-de-sac in Saint-Foy. It's the same neighbourhood as the mosque and less than a kilometre away. At the building today, neighbours were in disbelief. Simon Gagnon has lived down the hall since last summer. And I was so shocked and I'm still under shock really. It was uh, like 10 metres from here and... Uh, it's, uh, I'm still on job. Eric Desbois met Bissonnette at a conservative political discussion group and believes Bissonnette left the group because it was too moderate. I think he wants to uh, speak uh, immigration or uh, Islamism, Islamism uh, and in our group we speak of uh, debt, our economy, our uh, public management is not interesting for him. That's why he left. Dubois was chilled to hear Bissonnette's name linked to the attack. Yesterday, he contacted police who interviewed him about the suspect's political views. One acquaintance who studied with Bissonnette at university and last saw him about a year ago says his views were right-wing but not radical or extremist. I think that in the last year, something happened. He radicalized a lot because he seemed just a normal right-wing individual. Radio Canada has learned the shooter approached the mosque with two weapons Sunday night, a long gun and a pistol registered to Bissonnette. But sources say the long gun didn't work and that Bissonnette allegedly dropped it in the snow. Mohamed Haroun arrived at the scene moments after the shooting before police. I saw several bodies inside. Uh, it's uh, it's a, ch a, co a complete shock. Police have not commented on the motive behind the killings, but the deaths have prompted a discussion in Quebec about tolerance and tone. When I say that words matter, it means that words can hurt. Words can be knives slashing at people's conscience. And we have to be more cognizant of this. The premier says that this event has marked Quebec and that it will leave scars. But he says the outpouring of support proves that Quebecers are open, loving and caring people. All right, Allison, thanks very much. Well, as we saw both at last night's vigil and at tonight's mass, many in Quebec City are still in shock after unimaginable violence and immense loss. But six families are at the centre of this tragedy. They are in retreat struggling to come to terms with these deaths. Joanna Romiliotis has that part of the story tonight. Normand Richard's tribute is stark, singular. He's come to Azadine Soufian's shop, now a makeshift shrine, to pray for a man he didn't know. Par amour, uniquement. Par amour. For love only. For love, he says, to bring an energy of love. I still have faith in human beings. That's my prayer. It's a humble offering. 
and just steps from the crime scene, there are hundreds more for the six men killed. It's the ritual of public mourning, and it touches those hurting the most. We're, just, we're still shocked, right? So we, we aren't really sure how to react to it because it, it was sudden. So ba and other family drove here from Montreal today. They've come to this apartment building where grief now resides. Her uncle, Mamadou Tanubari, and his friend, Ibrahima Bari, both lived in the same building. They left to pray together the night they were killed. Between them, they leave six children behind. Fathers with families with young children, he says. That's what's so hard, that there's widows and young children left behind. Inside, Suleiman Ba stands outside a widow's door to speak for her because she simply can't. As a leader of the Guinean community here, he tries to be the brave one. I can tell you honestly, yesterday I was crying. I couldn't sleep, I was so overwhelmed. It could have happened to me. <laughs> ba was with both men the night they died. Quebec, he says, can be an insular place, but until now, never felt like a threatening one. Personally, I'm not afraid, he says, but I'm afraid of the future consequences, barbaric acts that could be repeated. That fear is real. But for now, it's being met with messages of solidarity. Neighbor and friend Manon Labrec has been piecing them together for days. I love my country. I love, I love those people. And those people, they are Canadian as much as I am. And they live in Quebec and they are part of us. They are part of this city. Grief, so personal, is also now so public a burden so many are offering to share. Ioana Rumeliotis, CBC News, Quebec City. Fox News tonight deleted a tweet about the mosque shooting after a complaint from the Prime Minister's office. Fox was among the media outlets that yesterday reported that the shooter was Moroccan. The reporting was corrected, but posts from Fox and some other organizations continue to circulate online. Coming up, the UN goes to bat for refugee kids deprived of their childhood. School, home, food, you know, that was peace. But who will cover the staggering cost? Plus, President Trump seems poised for a global shakeup. Turning Point looks at how far he can go and what it means for your security. Donald Trump announced his nominee for Supreme Court Justice tonight. Today I am keeping another promise to the American people by nominating Judge Neil Gorsuch. If the 49-year-old from Colorado is confirmed, the court will return to a conservative majority. Gorsuch is an originalist, meaning he believes the Constitution should be interpreted as the Founding Fathers would have interpreted it. He's never written on the landmark abortion case Roe v. Wade, but pro-lifers say his record against doctor-assisted suicide leaves them optimistic. The nominee may serve as a distraction tonight, but it could not overshadow the continued fallout in the U.S. today to Trump's travel ban. Some 900 State Department officials signed a letter of dissent over the order, and the administration hinted the three-month ban could become indefinite. Paul Hunter has more. For so many Americans, it's still a kind of stunned disbelief at what's unfolding. More protests tonight in Minneapolis and in Louisiana and today in South Carolina and in Texas with fury over Trump's new restrictions on refugees and on immigrants from certain Muslim countries. This is really what America looks like. And as protests raged on, more lawsuits from the state of Virginia. This order is unlawful, unconstitutional. The state of Massachusetts. My office is filing suit to challenge the executive order. From an Arab civil rights group in Michigan. Donald Trump 
does not trump the Constitution. As corporate America lines up against Trump as well, this Google-sanctioned demonstration yesterday came as executives from Facebook, Netflix, Apple, Starbucks, Ford, Nike, and others also spoke out against Trump's actions. When Toronto Raptors star, the Philadelphia-born Kyle Lowry, was asked about Trump's order, he held back little. Um, I think it's bullshit. I think it's absolute bullshit. The list of those opposing Trump includes a reported thousand or so U.S. Foreign Service workers said to have signed a scathing multi-page internal memo condemning Trump's order for being a throwback to some of the worst times in our history. And so, on Capitol Hill today... The level of incompetence of this administration already, only 10 days into the presidency, is staggering. But standing up to Trump can come with a price. As acting U.S. Attorney General Sally Yates learned yesterday, fired by Trump for saying she wouldn't enforce his order on refugees and immigration. Said the White House today Moving on to appointees who oppose Trump's Kelly agenda. Their job is to fulfill that, and if they don't like it, then, then they shouldn't take the job. But it is the president's agenda that we are fulfilling here. This being Trump's second week in office, the real question, where does all of this go from here? Opposition mounts, but so too Trump's resolve. Indeed, strengthened by the notion he's merely carrying out what he promised. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Parliament is holding an emergency debate tonight on the Trump travel order. The opposition demanding the Prime Minister take a firm stand against it and tell Trump as much. But as Katie Simpson tells us, it may not be that simple. Late into the evening, opposition MPs urge the government to do more for immigrants and refugees in the wake of the U.S. travel ban. A ban against individuals based on race, on religion, or country of birth simply cannot be tolerated. The emergency debate comes as the Prime Minister is facing increasing pressure to speak out. Why is he refusing to denounce this policy that breaches fundamental human rights and that will inevitably have consequences for Canada. We are protecting Canadian jobs and growing, uh, growing the economy uh, by having a constructive working relationship uh, with our most important uh, trade partner and ally. Uh, and we're also standing up for Canadian values and principles. Justin Trudeau has avoided directly criticizing Donald Trump, perhaps in the hopes of having a clean slate for their first meeting, which is expected to be confirmed in the coming days. Justin Trudeau's priority is to serve Canadian interests, and he would not serve Canadian interests by picking a fight with the President of the United States. This strategy isn't working for everyone. British Prime Minister Theresa May is facing backlash for her reluctance to denounce the policy after her visit to Washington. Trudeau did publish this tweet after the U.S. travel ban was announced, a potentially risky move for the Prime Minister's office, but one that fell short of condemnation. But working cooperatively with our biggest friend, largest trading partner is, uh, is perhaps the wisest approach. I don't think uh, governments should denounce other people. I Canada's former governor general, who presided over a citizenship ceremony today, agrees with the government's approach so far. But Adrian Clarkson warns the divisive tensions in the U.S. could have ripple effects here at home. We've been hearing the rhetoric of such horror, ignorance and hatred that we are in danger of being smothered by a tsunami. When Trudeau and Trump do meet, the Prime Minister plans to highlight the success of Canada's immigration system. But his top priority for those talks will be ensuring that trade continues between countries. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Ottawa. There are refugee claimants who make it into Canada secretly. We've told you their stories before. They walk across the border from the U.S., usually in the dead of night, to claim asylum. What's new? A noticeable spike this past weekend that refugee workers say was a direct result of Trump's order. Cameron McIntosh has the story. First of all, we, are, we came from Djibouti. We're concealing their identities because they fear political persecution back home. They are, like, we cannot say of Free, full freedom. On Friday night, this couple, who managed to make it to the United States, passed by these fields and snuck into Canada at Emerson, Manitoba, too fearful to apply for asylum in the United States. After what the political and the changement of the new government, 
we felt that our application couldn't be done or accepted. Located between Minneapolis and Winnipeg, Emerson sees a lot of refugee traffic. This weekend saw one of its biggest spikes. I'm establishing new vetting measures. To it coincided with Donald Trump's longer. executive order on immigration. The difference now of those crossing, most aren't even bothering to apply in the states, says this immigration counselor. They are really scared of what's going on in the U.S. Um, and that U.S. is not welcoming refugees and uh, asylum seekers anymore. So they just use the U.S. as a transit. Crossing a border to file a refugee claim is legal under international convention. Under Canada's Safe Third Country Agreement, an applicant can't make a claim to a border official from the U.S. There are calls to see that policy changed. If the U.S. Uh, is not going to protect them and they end up being sent back to the face persecution, then we are also sharing in uh, a, a guilt uh, for having sent them back to persecution. Canada's new immigration minister isn't prepared to go that far. This is a, an evolving situation. We intend to be on top of it. Meanwhile, aid groups are preparing for more applicants. No matter what the political rhetoric might be, at the end of the day, we all need to be keepers of our brothers and sisters. So far, the people we've met, like the real Canadians, of here, they are helpful. They are welcoming people. Now, just getting to Canada doesn't guarantee anything. In each circumstance, refugee claimants have to prove their case in a refugee board hearing. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. The United Nations court has ordered Turkey to free a U.N. judge who is one of thousands of people detained after last year's failed coup attempt. Aden Seyfa Akai is both a judge and a diplomat. The U.N. says his imprisonment violates his diplomatic immunity and the principle of judicial independence. Austria is planning to ban full-face veils such as the Muslim niqab and burqa in public places. The coalition government also wants to ban judges, police officers, and public prosecutors from wearing headscarves. And a few years after Second World War codebreaker Alan Turing was exonerated of sexual offense convictions, Britain today pardoned thousands of gay and bisexual men of similar convictions going back decades under anti-gay laws that have since been abolished. The hunt for a new uh, Canadian jet fighter has taken years, occupying minds in this government and the previous one. But now a decision seems to be nearing takeoff. The CBC's Murray Brewster has tracked down the details. Meet the newest jet fighter soon to be in the Canadian Air Force, the Boeing Super Hornet. The Liberal government announced last fall it wanted to buy 18 Super Hornets as an interim measure towards fully replacing the country's aging CF-18s. But how much will it cost? At the appropriate time, when we have all the necessary information, that price tag uh, will be uh, explained to Canadians. So that means the price tag will be explained after the deal is done. The Liberal government, which stakes a claim on transparency, has not even attempted to publicly ballpark this sole source multi-billion dollar plan. To understand how much the Super Hornets could cost, all you have to do is look at Pentagon data. According to U.S. Defense Department documents, the cost of the Super Hornet Canada wants to buy is roughly $85 million Canadian. There is also approximately $26 million for equipment, such as radar and engines, another $3.8 million in Pentagon service charges, and a possible $8 million for development costs. The total for each Super Hornet could run between $115 and $123 million. Preliminary internal DND estimates say the whole program might cost between $5 to $7 billion. But Sajin cautions that's not a price tag. There is no right now price tag. Although the Super Hornets manufacturer says it is a good guide. Uh, but the U.S. Navy documents are, the U.S. government documents are a good reflection. Boeing Super Hornets have competed against Lockheed Martin's F-35 stealth jets, which the Liberals have dismissed as too expensive. U.S. President Donald Trump has been battering Lockheed Martin to bring down the price of the F-35. Analysts wonder if the Liberals' political argument is about to crash and burn. So the, the difference in price between an F-35 or a Super Hornet is not going to be all that large. 
All of this frustrates the opposition in Ottawa. Just go straight to an, uh, a competition and make sure that we get the best plane for the taxpayers and for the Royal Canadian Air Force. The deal for Canada to buy Super Hornets still needs congressional approval, but there is little doubt that the plan is about to take off. Canadian Air Force officials were down here just recently talking with Boeing engineers about customization options for the new aircraft. Murray Brewster, CBC News, St. Louis. Workers in New Brunswick are getting closer to restoring all the power, but a week after a devastating ice storm, the job's still not quite done. Several thousand customers remain cut off with supplies running low. So today the province said it will buy $100,000 worth of food and work with food banks to get it to those in need. A Calgary man has been found not guilty of sexual assault in a second trial after the headline-grabbing conduct of the judge in his first trial. That judge, Robin Camp, made inappropriate comments to the complainant, including asking her why she couldn't just keep her knees together. That landed him in front of the Canadian Judicial Council. It recommended he lose his job. And a prominent Toronto clergyman is not guilty of sex crimes alleged to have happened in the 1970s. Brent Hawkes was tried in Nova Scotia. The Order of Canada recipient is a well-known advocate for the LGBTQ community and officiated at former NDP leader Jack Layton's 2011 funeral. Former Liberal leader Stéphane Dion will be Canada's next ambassador to Germany and the European Union. In its own way, the European continent is facing the same challenges as us. Dion announced he would leave federal politics earlier this month. He was a member of parliament since 1996. He was in the cabinets of Jean Chrétien, Paul Martin, and Justin Trudeau. Prince Edward Island has signed a health deal with Ottawa. It joins the other Atlantic provinces as well as Saskatchewan and the territories. All the premiers walked away from health talks in December rejecting Ottawa's offer, holding out for a new health accord. New Brunswick was the first to sign a bilateral deal days later. Well, straight ahead, has the Trump administration's opening act made you more or less worried about the future? Thoughts from the Turning Point panel are coming up next.
from establishing new vetting, measures to keep radical Islamic terrorists out of the United States of America. We don't want them here. Donald Trump, just last Friday. Supposedly, he's now the most powerful person in the world. So how has the world changed? We've got three key questions tonight for our Turning Point experts. The new immigration rules you just heard Trump talk about. How will the fight against ISIS change with him in the chair? And if Trump is the leader of the free world, does he have NATO's back? Dr. Samantha Nutt is the founder of War Child Canada. She's also just back from Iraq. Saeed Khan is a professor of international affairs at Wayne State University in Michigan. And Brian Stewart is the CBC's distinguished former global affairs correspondent. Now, Sam and Brian are here in Toronto. Saeed, as you see on the screen, is in Detroit. And Saeed, why don't I start with you? Because the, the original idea was you were going to be sitting here with us. You're not. That's right. Why? That's right. Well, the Muslim ban uh, that uh, President Trump has uh, uh, initiated is uh, far deeper than just the executive order which targets seven Muslim countries and ostensibly refugees and non-immigrants. U.S. citizens are also noticing a sharp increase of uh, extreme vetting and uh, scrutiny to the point where they're even being threatened with having their passports and their smartphones uh, confiscated. So basically you were worried about not get coming here but getting back well there was a matter of uh, throwing caution to the wind and uh, wondering how many hours uh, potentially there could have been uh, extra uh, checking which would then would have either uh, made me miss a flight uh, and then even perhaps uh, missed uh, my teaching schedule now Saeed called it a Muslim ban and a lot of people are, are using that term uh, the White House is arguing today it's not even a ban we don't use that word in spite of the fact that the president has used it himself a couple of times in the last few days how does this fit into the bigger picture that we've been talking about and are going to talk about tonight in terms of, of the impact on the world and the relationship with the U.S.? Eh? I think, as Saeed has said, I, mean, I think for most Muslims living in America and outside of America, the message is you are not welcome here. You're going to be subjected to uh, onerous policies and procedures and unreasonable delays. I mean, it's the worst, frankly, kind of cynical politics, uh, xenophobia, and I think it's, frankly, outrageous. Um, and, and on top of that, when you look at the message this sends beyond America's borders, um, it, is, it is a very dangerous message, it's especially a dangerous message in parts of the world that are trying to stoke that kind of, of, of sense that people are not welcome, uh, welcome by the West, are not welcome by America. Uh, so come to us, group like, groups like ISIS saying, come to us, we'll happily receive you and we'll happily uh, uh, make sure that you feel welcome. Brian? I'd like to pick up a point there on the, uh, the paranoia almost feeling of it, that uh, even back in the height of the Cold War, watching American governments, I never sensed a degree of fear that this new administration is putting out there. They're, they seem frightened of everything. Frightened of illegal immigrants from the South, build a wall. Frightened of bad trade deals in Asia, drop out of TPP. Frightened of Europe, start questioning uh, whether NATO uh, works or not. And now frightened of immigrants, people coming in from the Middle East, put a halt on a number of countries. You know, when Roosevelt came into power in the United States, the height of the Depression, he said, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. This seems to be administration saying, we have everything to fear, and we can fear it everywhere. And this is a deep psychological state that I'm not sure they're going to get over soon. Well, let me just throw the counter out and say, you, you respond to it. This is what, in many of these cases, and especially this issue of the ban, this is what Trump campaigned on. This is what he said he was going to do. Are, well, the, why are people surprised? Well, I don't think a lot of people really are surprised, especially his base uh, to whom he's appealing. In fact, they've had a very good week and a half because in, uh, in many ways he has fulfilled every promise uh, upon which he ran in his campaign. And yet at the same time, the manner in which he is promulgating these policies is causing an awful lot of concern. Case in point with the executive order based on immigration, the fact that there was no consultation of uh, many of the agencies within his own control in the executive branch has got Washington, uh, the establishment, as well as the entire government structure uh, literally running for cover and also wondering what's coming next. All right. Let me move it to the ISIS situation. You just uh, raised it, Sam. So I want to get your thoughts as somebody who's just back from Iraq. But some are arguing that what has happened here with this ban, 
uh, is only going to embolden ISIS at a time when many thought it was losing influence, especially in the, in the recruitment areas. Does it, in fact, is it going to do that, embolden ISIS? Well, the question here, Peter, is that ISIS has been losing geographic territory, especially uh, in Mosul and beyond Mosul, but still has managed to maintain its foothold in Syria. So in terms of, of uh, ISIS's ability to recruit people to go overseas and fight for them, I still think that that is um, not necessarily going to be influenced by this. But what I do think that these kinds of policies and procedures will do is it will mobilize, it will activate some of those uh, lone wolf or small cell networks who will feel uh, much more aggrieved, much more excluded, it will pander to that sense of victimization. So whether they are officially part of ISIS or whether they're part of another uh, more militant movement or even if they're just self-radicalized, the outcome is still the same, which is that this kind of, of violence that, that people are, are bearing witness to, this sense of exclusion, will beget, unfortunately, other forms of violence. Brian, where are you on uh, Well, I agree. I think it's going to uh, stoke up, really, a desire, not only on ISIS, but remember the not-dead-yet Al-Qaeda and lone, as you, Sam said, lone wolf operators to, to strike fast and strike out. The one feeling I have too is we shouldn't just think this is going to be a U.S. thing. That is, it has increased risks for Americans abroad, Americans perhaps at home, but certainly abroad and American soldiers in the field, I think it will certainly increase some risk. But also I don't think terrorist groups are all that discerning on who they strike out at. I think Western nations in general, Canada, Europe, yeah, are also going to have heightened security concerns now because of this amazingly inept move by the U.S. government. Said, uh, we talked about what Trump campaigned on. On ISIS, he campaigned on saying he had a, he had a plan, a secret plan. He wasn't going to tell anybody what it was in terms of how to fight ISIS. Are we any further ahead in, in knowing whether he has one and if he does, what it is? Absolutely not. Now, he has impressed upon his uh, staff to provide him with uh, information so that he can then, of course, tweet about it and, uh, and make it public. Of course, he doesn't want to make everything public because he doesn't want to let ISIS know what his plan is. Uh, at the same time, uh, as uh, both Brian and Sam have said uh, so aptly, that the danger of how the West is moving toward this greater sense of hypernationalism, some would even say neo-fascism, and really Islamophobia. Uh, uh, in the case of Austria, a full ban on the uh, on the face veil. In the case of the upcoming elections this year in France with Marine Le Pen. In the case of the Netherlands with Geert Wilders. The fact that the West is now seemingly positioning itself in the fulfillment of this clash of civilizations binary is simply going to then provide oxygen, which then uh, allows uh, ISIS to fan the flames even further. Sam, give us your on-the-ground experience. You've been in Mosul uh, for most of the last 10 days. Um, in terms of ISIS, taking the fight to ISIS, this has been going on for years now. This was supposed to be a ragtag bunch. Mm -hmm. They're still there. You know, there have been advances made on, uh, on ISIS. but. It, does the fight against ISIS need a new shift in the direction it's taking, the way it is taking the fight to ISIS? Well, I think, Peter, if you look at what's been happening, and I was, I was outside of Mosul, I was in the region, and uh, certainly managed to interview a number of people who have been uh, displaced as a result of this violence and sort of looking at who they hold responsible for their, uh, their, their, their catastrophe, their misery, um, and they blame ISIS for that misery. So in terms of the kind of regional perspective, at least the Iraqi perspective, uh, ISIS is losing, uh, it is losing territory. However, it has been able to buttress those military efforts with its foothold within Syria. And what we've seen in recent months, for example, when it comes to the Syrian crisis, is that there has not been a willingness to then go after ISIS in those locations. The approach has been to strengthen Assad, uh, backed by Russia, to sort of turn a blind eye to, to what they have been doing uh, beyond that. And, and, and unfortunately, that, that part has not resulted in any sort of meaningful decrease in the presence or profile of ISIS. So it still, it still has territory, um, and, I, and I don't see that changing at least in the short term. All right, Brian, uh, you mentioned earlier the relationship between uh, the U.S. and uh, the rest of the world in particular, its NATO allies. Does this new president, does he or does he not have NATO's back? Well, 
before I say that, I just want to say one thing on the ISIS fight, if I could, because the only way forward I think he's going to find that's going to be new, apart from more airstrikes, is to go in alliance with Russia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And to go in alliance with Russia is to bring him in alliance with the Assad regime, with Turkey, which is going through a, a somewhat difficult stage, let's say, and with Iran and with Hezbollah. So I think NATO is, is standing back wondering who is he going with here? I mean, he will increase Russia's influence in the Middle East, certainly by going in alliance with Russia. That's going to change an awful lot of, of uh, European thinking. I think he's now deciding, because he's under some pressure, that he has to seem more pro-NATO. But nobody in Europe can figure out how he's going to get a great new relationship with Russia, including a fight in, in the Middle East. And, and somehow bring security peace back to, to Europe. So he's still questioning. The Germans are saying, we're not sure we can trust the United States at this stage. Well, That's an amazing statement now. It is an amazing statement, but his words caused those kinds of statements. So. In a matter of hours last week, he went from saying NATO was an obsolete organization to he's 100% behind it. But there's no way around the fact that the U.S. needs NATO. It's the oldest, most successful military alliance in history. Unless it becomes a completely introverted country, isolationist country, it needs that NATO alliance, and he's going to have to, to deal with it. Saeed, your thoughts on this? Well, I think the question is coming up to uh, old NATO versus new NATO. Uh, there may be, for Trump, a begrudging support of the original NATO alliance, uh, which came about in, 19, uh, in the 1950s. But, of course, now NATO has grown to 27 uh, member states and includes uh, what were once uh, parts of the Soviet Union, the Baltic states of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, as well as uh, former members of the Warsaw Pact, including Pol uh, Poland. I'm uh, going to be looking at whether or not there's going to be a retreat of support from the new NATO areas as a way to placate Putin. If, in fact, this is going to be a new great game in the Middle East where the United States is going to be cooperating with Russia to essentially split into zones of influence, uh, Syria, Iran, and Iraq to Russia, the Gulf states, uh, the Arab states to the United States, uh, the U.S. is going to have to give uh, Putin something back. And I'm wondering if the bargaining chip there is going to be a withdrawal uh, of the kind of robust support that has been there now for several years in the new NATO. Hmm. You'd have to do that, though, in the face of real opposition from Congress, yep. from within his own party, from the Christian right in America. I mean, to a certain extent, they'll start getting nervous if the Amer Americans start pulling support back from, the, you know, a stand against Russia. Um, even though it's, you know, a lot of the right are saying this isn't the old Russia, this is not communist, these are very different peoples. There is still an ease in Europe that uh, they must have American backing or else all sorts of countries will have to start making their own deals. And Sam, you got the last word. I think that there's such, there's such inconsistency with this policy. We're seeing a massive reconfiguring of the Arab world and the Middle East. We're seeing tremendous regional tensions that have been flaring up. We're seeing uh, a, a contradictory policy from the American administration in terms of uh, banning Iran and Syrian and Iraqi refugees, for example, and yet effectively propping up Assad, uh, propping up Iran, supporting Russia in those endeavors, uh, not putting on that list Saudi Arabia, which had the largest number of contributors to the September 11th attacks. So that, that income congruity is sending a great deal of confusion out into the world, but also creating so much tension and so much resentment that I just see that if we continue down this path, um, from a geopolitical perspective, what we're going to be seeing is less of a world order and more of a world disorder. And frankly, um, in terms of the line of work that I do every day, dealing with people on the front lines of those crises, that is a very dangerous proposition. All right. We'll leave it at that. Thank you, Brian and Sam and uh, Saeed next time, right? You're going to come. Absolutely. All yep. right. More from the Turning Point panel in the weeks ahead, as events warrant. More from the National, coming right up. It breaks your heart to see that a 12-year-old is able to draw a sniper. The UN highlights the plight of refugee kids, why so many children of war aren't even on our radar. And on our Viewpoint segment, the argument for ending Black History Month.
Well, global protests in the face of recent U.S. immigration policies have focused political attention on the world's refugee crisis. Today, the U.N. agency dedicated to children reminded everyone just what's at stake. In launching its 2017 campaign, UNICEF says conflicts and emergencies have left 48 million children in need of humanitarian assistance, aid that will cost more than $3 billion. They live in four dozen countries and need water, sanitation, health care, plus so much more, including food and education. That's the focus of this story from the CBC's Neil Koksel in Turkey. Childhood, just as it should be. In classrooms across Istanbul, teachers are trying to make sure Syria's youngest refugees actually live their childhoods. Play is the most therapeutic thing that happens to them. When this clinical psychologist has worked with hundreds of Syrian children in Turkish refugee camps, asking them to draw some of their experience. It breaks your heart to see that a 12-year-old is able to draw a sniper or, uh, you know, 16 different types of weaponry, whereas a uh, same 12-year-old here is drawing pirates. This is obviously a scene that she has witnessed with de a dead baby and blood and tears and tra very traumatic picture. Two years ago, Syrian children were everywhere, on streets like this one in Istanbul. Since then, though, there's been a dramatic shift. Turkish schools are now open to Syrian children. UNICEF says that's an important step forward, but it also points out 380,000 Syrian children here still are not getting an education. Today, the UN says it needs to raise $3.3 billion to help children around the world. A third of that money would help refugees now taking shelter in Turkey, Egypt and Jordan. $230 million would go to help another crisis, killing children. Slow to react to Syria, the world, it seems, has barely noticed the conflict in Yemen and its horrific effects. Definitely children are dying of malnutrition, that is for sure. 63,000 children have already died from illnesses that could have been prevented, and millions more are at risk. The health system is really uh, on the verge of, of collapse, and we might have returned to under five mortality rates of almost 10 years ago, actually. And with the all too real reality show distractions in the U.S., the constant anti-refugee rhetoric swirling worldwide, those working to help children and their families worry that people will forget. If helping seems too hard, Ozar tries to simplify it. But for these kids, just give me back my normal life, school, home, food. You know, that was peace. A normal life that today seems so far from reality. Neil Koksal, CBC News, Istanbul. According to a breakdown of costs put together by UNICEF, education is actually the most expensive sector, followed by water and sanitation, then nutrition. Now stay tuned for another new voice on The National. Tonight on our Viewpoints segment, blogger and activist B. Kwame. You'll see why she's had it with Black History Month. But first, let's check the day's business numbers. The TSX dropped 19 points. The Canadian dollar rose six-tenths of a cent. In New York, the Dow lost 107 points, and the price of oil closed up 18 cents a barrel.
Hi, my name is B. Kwame. I'm a writer, a mother, and a proud Jamaican Canadian. I've spent a lot of time thinking about what it means to be Black in Canada. And I want to talk to you about why it's time for Black History Month to go. Tomorrow marks the start of Black History Month. And honestly, I'm fed up with the whole thing. Why? Because it's time that we stopped forcing people to pay lip service to black people's achievements in Canada once a year. In 1995, the Honorable Jean Augustine, the first black woman elected to Parliament, motioned the House of Commons to designate February as Black History Month. As an educator, she saw that black history was a footnote in what our kids are being taught. And she once said, black Canadians were not part of the script and were not shown contributing to Canadian society. But how much has really changed since we got a Black History Month? I would say that Canada has become smug and complacent in its benevolence, and we all deserve better. Right now, Black History Month is a whirlwind of events, shows, and educational lectures crammed into the shortest and coldest month of the year. And by the time March comes around, space in the school curriculum dries up, event funding diminishes, and we wait another year before we do it all again. There is no benefit to treating black history like something that goes stale by March 1st, because black Canadian history is Canadian history. We can't build a just future for all if we don't acknowledge everyone who contributed to our past. We barely learn about black Canadian history, and if we do, it almost always requires an American counterpart for people to get why it matters. The Bank of Canada recently announced that Viola Desmond will be featured on our new $10 bills. But how many Canadians know her full story? And how many of us know why it's reductive to call her Canada's Rosa Parks? Mainstream history teaches us very little about Canada's own story of enslaving black people, or how Canada sidestepped its racist immigration laws by enacting the West Indian Domestic Scheme, which, by the way, is the very program that brought Jean Augustine to Canada in 1960. It's easy to assume that black people haven't done much in Canada because we don't learn much about our achievements. So how do we fix this? How about a Canada where black history is firmly embedded into our national story year round and we're transparent and authentic in its telling? What could a Black History Month look like? Imagine a true celebration that kicks off in July with Afrofest, North America's largest free African music festival, and ends with the world-renowned Caribbean festival that I will always call Caribana. A season that allows for more creativity and connection. But hey, a girl can dream. For The National, I'm B. Kwame. I'm Anna Maria Tremonti. Tomorrow on The Current, we continue our public forums on missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls with a focus on the role of the media and the arts in telling their stories. That's on The Current, weekday mornings at 8.30 on CBC Radio 1.
the guns. Is that your wife? No! X Company, Wednesday at 9 on CBC. Fans of this classic video game may be saddened to hear that the man considered to be the father of Pac-Man has died. 91-year-old Masaya Nakamura founded Namco, the company that created one of the most successful video games ever made. First release in 1980, Pac-Man has been played more than 10 billion times, eating his way into the hearts of gamers around the world. That's The Nationalist Tuesday night. For news at any hour, you can always go to our website, cbcnews.ca. I'm Peter Mansbridge. Thanks for watching.